This is the last in a series of 18 chest imaging essentials talks. Over the last 17 talks, we've discussed how to handle different types of features in the lungs, pleural issues like pneumothoraces, pleural fluid, pleural thickening, and pleural soft tissue masses, tracheal and bronchial disorders, how to approach problems in the anterior, middle, and posterior mediastinum, and issues like hyalur enlargement, hyalur shift, central anterobronchial disorders, and endovascular disorders. If we save the heart and thoracic aorta for our cardiovascular sessions, what remains is the topic of this talk, how to handle chest wall disorders and diaphragm disorders. The two non-neoplastic types of chest wall disorders we'll cover are congenital variants and acute chest wall issues. The two neoplastic groups of chest wall disorders will be bone tumors and soft tissue tumors, and the two diaphragmatic disorder categories will cover our hernias and elevation. Let's talk about non-neoplastic chest wall disorders, starting with congenital variants. The common congenital chest wall variants you need to be familiar with are cervical ribs and the two pectus chest wall deformities. And two rare congenital variants I'd like you to know are cleidocranial dysostosis and pollen syndrome. Cervical ribs. Cervical ribs are extra ribs, either bilateral or unilateral, coming off of the C7 vertebra. The overwhelming majority of cervical ribs are asymptomatic, though in a small number of patients, cervical ribs can press on something nearby. If it's a nerve that's being pressed on, the patient might get symptoms like arm pain or arm weakness. If it's a vein, um, that can sometimes impair the drainage of blood from an arm, and patients may report hand or even arm swelling. And in a few patients, you might even be able to detect a difference in radial pulses if the cervical rib is pushing on an artery hard enough. A common mimic uh, we encounter when diagnosing cervical ribs are hypoplastic first ribs coming off of the T1 vertebra, since they'll often look a little unusual in cervical rib-ish. Um, a helpful tip for telling a cervical rib apart from a hypoplastic first rib on chest x-ray is to look at the transverse process that rib is articulating with. The transverse processes of thoracic vertebral bodies tend to point upwards, while the transverse processes of cervical vertebral bodies um, generally point more horizontally. On chest CTs, um, you can use the manubrial sternal junction as a landmark. Um, since you usually won't have the dens on your chest CT volume, uh, the manubrial sternal junction is the next best landmark. Um, true second ribs generally articulate with the manubrial sternal junction, and that will help you figure out if the rib you're looking at is a first rib or not. Pectus excavatum. Folks with pectus excavatum have a depressed sternum. Um, in these patients, uh, the ribs appear as if they're protruding anteriorly on both sides um, relative to midline. Folks believe that pectus excavatum um, happens because of some sort of abnormal growth of the inferior costochondral cartilages. Because the distance between the sternum and the thoracic spine is decreased in cases of pectus excavatum, the heart can sometimes be displaced leftward, like in the patient on this chest x-ray. This can also result in a displaced heart with a somewhat unusual shape um, than you're normally accustomed to seeing on a lateral chest x-ray too. Because the heart is displaced into the left hemithorax in some folks with pectus excavatum, the volume of the left lung may also appear reduced. The severity of pectus excavatum is often estimated uh, using the pectus index, which is the transverse diameter of the rib cage divided by its anteroposterior diameter. And these measurements are generally made inner surface to inner surface of the rib cage. Different pectus indices will correspond to different grades of severity, and the moderate and severe cases are often the ones that may require surgical correction. Pectus carinatum is the inverse of pectus excavatum. And in carinatum folks, the sternum protrudes anteriorly. Uh, an older term for this disorder was pigeon chest, which interestingly shares the same initials as pectus carinatum. Pectus carinatum is less common than excavatum, and it usually occurs in isolation, though a small number of cases have been reported 
um, that were associated with congenital heart disease. Cladocranial dysostosis is one of the two uncommon congenital chest wall variants I'd like you to know. In folks with this disorder, the clavicle may be entirely absent, like on the right side in this patient, or hypoplastic, um, like on the left side in this patient. Um, sometimes um, in cladocranial dysostosis, the clavicle may appear as two separate hypoplastic segments too. Folks believe that cladocranial dysostosis is a consequence of some sort of abnormal ossification of the clavicles. And in these folks, abnormal ossification of other bones uh, can sometimes happen too, resulting in features like uh, delayed or late fontanelle closure in the head, um, facial bone issues, um, unusual vertebral bodies, and underdevelopment of um, long bones. Poland syndrome is the other uncommon congenital variant I'd like you to know. It's named after a British surgeon, not the country, and it's an anomaly where the pectoralis muscle is either completely missing or partially missing, the pectoralis major muscle. Uh, because of the absence of the pec major muscle in the anterior chest wall, uh, pollen syndrome can resemble mastectomy patients at um, mastectomy features um, at first glance. Um, the upper ribs in cases of pollen syndrome can also be either absent or hypoplastic in some folks. Um, in addition to the upper rib issues in people with pollen syndrome, pec minor, breast, or nipple may sometimes be absent or underdeveloped. And there are two hand associations with pollen syndrome. Uh, one is uh, syndactyly or, or finger, uh, fusion of the fingers, and the other is a simian crease. In normal hands, there are two horizontal creases in the palm, which uh, fortune tellers used to call the heart line and the head line. Um, in folks with a simian crease, there's only one um, line. Now let's uh, talk about acute chest wall disorders you'll need to be prepared to handle. And there's three, chest wall infections, hematomas, and iatrogenic hernias. Chest wall infections, when they happen, are usually secondary. Staph aureus and pseudomonas are common culprits when the chest wall infection is associated with recent surgery, trauma, or direct spread of empyema. In cases where the source appears to be lung infection rather than pleural infection, spread to the ch um, um, spreading to the chest wall, folks tend to think of other causes like tuberculosis and fungal infection. And in cases of chest wall infection in drug addicts, uh, septic arthritis is a common source, either from the sternoclavicular joints or the sternochondral joints. Chest wall infections um, can present on imaging as either a focal fluid accumulation or soft tissue density mass. The normal soft tissue planes in the chest wall are often obscured and missing um, in the region. And if the chest wall infection has been around long enough, you may also see some changes in the adjacent bone, um, changes like periosteal reaction or destruction of bone or cartilage. We sometimes use the term empyema necessitans to describe chest wall infections caused by an empyema spreading from the pleural space into the chest wall. And empyema necessitans in tuberculosis was something that I remember hearing a bit about um, in residency, um, but it's a relatively uncommon finding. It's um, actually more common for infections to reach the chest wall via the bloodstream than direct spread from lung or pleura. On the subject of empyemas and chest wall, um, there's um, a quick aside that I like to uh, make, and it's about open window thoracostomies. Open window thoracostomies are windows in the chest wall that are created surgically to provide long-term drainage of a chronic empyema since you can only rely on pleural drains and tubes only so long. The two most common types of open window thoracostomies are the Claggett window and the Ellerser flap. The two are kind of tough to distinguish from each other on imaging. Um, however, um, Claggett windows tend to be temporary um, and they're windows that surgeons hope they'll eventually be able to go back and close, while Ellerser flaps tend to be permanent and are generally smaller than Claggett windows. You'll also encounter chest wall hematomas um, when uh, reading um, chest imaging, um, particularly uh, if um, there's a lot of trauma patients or, or inpatients you're looking at. 
Acute chest wall hematomas um, will usually appear hyperattenuating to muscle, especially if they're fresh, and um, often asymmetric. Uh, and so comparing one chest wall to the other um, is sometimes helpful. Iatrogenic hernias may happen in folks who've undergone a prior thoracotomy. Um, on these occasions, you'll perhaps see a portion of lung pooch out through the rib cage and into the deep chest wall between two ribs. Let's talk about chest wall neoplasms now. And we'll start with bone tumors in the chest wall. There are non-aggressive and aggressive bone tumors you'll encounter. And the three most common non-aggressive chest wall bone tumors you'll encounter are fibrous dysplasia, enchondromas, and osteochondromas. Fibrous dysplasia is a benign bone tumor that often involves the ribs and results in focal fusiform enlargement of the rib. You'll usually see that the cortex and trabecula may be thickened, but they should appear intact. Cases of fibrous dysplasia tend to involve the posterior and the lateral segments of the ribs and are usually slow growing. It's not uncommon to encounter fibrous dysplasia uh, in a rib on chest CTs, and folks generally leave them alone only unless they grow big enough to cause symptoms. Enchondromas are another benign bone tumor you might encounter when looking at the chest wall. Enchondromas often involve the ribs or costochondral junctions when they occur in the chest wall. Like fibrous dysplasia, they're also slow growing. Enchondromas, however, are much more uncommon than fibrous dysplasia in the chest wall. And some folks report that chondrosarcomas are actually more common than enchondromas in the chest wall. So I tend to be cautious when I'm considering this diagnosis. I'm usually not hesitant in reaching out to one of my friends in MSK radiology to take a peek at these sort of cases. Osteochondromas are a benign bone tumor we'll see time to time in the chest wall. They'll appear as a pedunculated bony growth from the surface of a rib that shares a continuous marrow with the rib. They're also much less common than fibrous dysplasia. The two most common aggressive chest wall bone tumors you'll encounter by far will be METS and myeloma. However, there are two other aggressive bone tumors you should be familiar with. Um, those are chondrosarcomas and osteosarcomas. Chondrosarcs and osteosarcs in the chest wall, though, are pretty rare. And I've probably only encountered one or two cases in the last 10 years as a chest radiologist. Bone metastases. Bone mets in the chest will occur in the spine most frequently. And the top three causes are breast cancer, lung cancer, and as in this patient, prostate cancer. Bone mets um, can be blastic, lytic, or mixed. Prostate metastases are the ones that tend to be blastic, while lung and renal mets tend to be lytic. When I see mixed blastic lytic um, bone metastases, I tend to think of, chest, of uh, breast cancer first. Multiple myeloma is the other aggressive bone tumor you'll encounter in the chest wall. They tend to be quite diffuse in, pre in, in distribution in their um, presentation, um, and will often appear as uh, punched out lytic lesions. Sometimes you'll, associate, you'll see associated soft tissue masses in these cases. It's a common disease you'll encounter in the elderly population. Chondrosarcomas. Chondrosarcs um, can resemble osteochondromas and enchondromas on chest x-ray. The sternum and costochondral junctions are common sites. Beside Location, tip-offs for chondrosarcomas in the chest wall uh, include features like aggressive bone destruction, cartilaginous matrices um, with calcifications that might appear flocculent, stippled, or as rings and arcs. They're generally uncommon. Osteosarcomas are the other aggressive, uncommon bone tumor of the chest wall that may occur once in a blue moon. You'll be looking for some of the typical features of osteosarcoma we learn on MSK, uh, including bone destruction, aggressive 
periosteal reaction and dense central calcification or, or dense central ossification. The prognosis of osteosarcoma when it occurs in the chest wall is particularly poor. Ground rules with uh, bone tumors in the chest wall. Um, if I have three to make up are uh, number one, uh, most um, will be METs and lung cancer and breast cancer will usually be the most common primary. Two, most sternal and vertebral bone tumors are malignant. And three, rib lesions have a much broader differential diagnosis than other bones in the chest wall. Moving on now to soft tissue tumors. We'll divide soft tissue tumors of the chest wall into two buckets, ones that may present specifically on imaging and ones that don't. The soft tissue tumors of the chest wall that tend to present specifically on imaging are lipomas, liposarcomas, elastofibroma dorsi, NFs, and schwannomas. Lipomas will appear as small, medium, or large chest wall masses with homogeneous fat attenuation. They're benign and generally left alone unless they become huge. Liposarcomas are malignant lipomatous tumors that unlike lipomas will have a non-fatty component. Uh, this, can appear, this can appear as stranding uh, indistinct soft tissue opacities or nodular soft tissue opacities that can enhance on contrast imaging. Elastofibromas are ill-defined soft tissue masses in a very characteristic location near the inferior scapular tip, deep to the serratus and latissimus dorsi. Elastofibroma dorsi are typically isoattenuating to muscle on CT. When soft tissue masses fitting this description are present bilaterally, we usually call these elastofibroma dorsi and recommend no further imaging or workup. However, in cases where a mass of this, of this description is unilateral, um, it could certainly be one of the 40% of elastofibroma dorsi cases that are unilateral. But since other nonspecific soft tissue tumors need to be excluded, we may proceed to an MRI. Most cases of elastofibroma dorsi are asymptomatic, but a small number can be associated with symptoms like pain or shoulder snapping. We discussed NF and schwannoma in our posterior mediastinum talk. Cases of NF or schwannoma um, that present as chest wall masses usually arise from the intercostal nerves that parallel the ribs. Although things like ribbon ribs and enlarged neuroforamina can occur uh, due to pressure erosion, there should otherwise be no bone destruction in cases of NF or schwannoma. And these tumors also tend to grow slowly. Two soft tissue tumors that tend to be quite nonspecific on their imaging um, are desmoids and MFHs. When desmoid tumors appear in the chest wall, they'll often present as a soft tissue lesion with indistinct margins. The intercostal muscles and shoulder girdle uh, are reported to be the most common locations desmoids occur in the chest wall. Uh, in this particular example, the desmoid tumor happens to be in a, um, an interesting location that's easy to miss. It's between the anterior left chest wall, left uh, rib cage, and the left breast implant. And its imaging features are otherwise pretty nonspecific. Desmoids tend to be classified as benign, but can demonstrate locally aggressive behavior. MFHs are another soft tissue tumor of the chest wall that usually presents as a pretty nonspecific looking soft tissue lesion, like the one in this example. They're pretty uncommon and usually occur in older folks. So these are the soft tissue chest wall tumors you should be prepared to recognize. If the mass contains fat and contains septi, nodular enhancement, or at, you know over 25% soft tissue component, think liposarcoma. Whereas if the fat is totally clean, think lipoma. If the soft tissue mass is near the inferior scapular tip, and particularly if it's bilateral, think elastofibroma dorsi. It's time to talk about diaphragmatic disorders now. And we'll start with how the diaphragm develops during embryogenesis. The diaphragm develops within the bounds of the muscular body wall from three elements, the transverse septum, mesentery, and the pleuroperitoneal folds.
The central tendon of the diaphragm is derived from the transverse septum, while the muscular diaphragm arises from the pleuroperitoneal folds, mesentery, and muscular body wall. There are three holes within the diaphragm. The hiatus of the IVC with the blue arrow, the esophageal hiatus with the yellow arrow, and the aortic hiatus with the purple arrow. There are two arcuate ligaments along the posterior diaphragm on, on each side. The, medium, the median arcuate ligament in green astride the anterior psoas muscle and the lateral arcuate ligament in tan here astriding the um, quadratus laborum muscle. Defects of, the tr of a transverse septum fusion to the chest wall result in Borgagni hernias while Defectmental defects of the pleuroperitoneal fold fusion to the chest wall uh, to the body wall result in boctolic hernias. Enlargement of the esophageal hiatus results in hiatal hernias, while traumatic hernias appear when the integrity of the diaphragm is breached, usually where central tendon meets muscular diaphragm. Let's look at imaging examples of these four types of diaphragmatic hernias. Here's an example of a Morgagni hernia. And look at how mesenteric fat on this coronal MRI image passes, uh, um, MRA um, CT, uh, volume passes from the anterior abdomen into the anterior chest with a segment of transverse colon and its associated mesenteric vessels. Here are a few images of a right sided boctolic hernia, and we can see how the posterior diaphragm doesn't reach the muscular body wall on this sagittal NPR image. Um, these are the corresponding chest x-ray images of this particular boctolic hernia. Hyal hernias are common and divided into four major types. Type 1 sliding hyal hernias are the most common ones, uh, but also the ones for which our sensitivity and specificity on chest x-ray and CT are pretty mediocre. Type 2 hyal hernias, um, like the example on this image, are rare. Um, in type 2 hyal hernias, the gastric fundus is above the diaphragm, but the GE junction is under the diaphragm. Type 3 hiatal hernias, like this case, are the most common type after sliding type 1 hiatal hernias. With type 3 hiatal hernias, both the GE junction and the gastric fundus are above the diaphragm. In type 4 hernias, hiatal hernias, like this case, other organs beside the stomach will have passed into the um, chest. Organs like the colon and pancreas in this example. Traumatic hernias tend to occur in the posterolateral diaphragm near the site during embryogenesis where the transverse septum fuses with what will become the muscular diaphragm. Because the left hemidiaphragm isn't shielded by a large solid organ like the liver, traumatic diaphragmatic hernias are much more common on the left side. Besides looking for obvious herniation of abdominal organs into the chest, um, we're usually careful in trauma CTs to inspect the diaphragm carefully. Um, does the arc of the diaphragm look different than usual? Does the thin muscular line on CT that corresponds to the diaphragm appear interrupted or focally thickened? Um, when we see what looks like um, abdominal organ herniating into the chest via a traumatic hernia, is there a collar sign? where the herniated bowel or stomach is focally constrained as it passes through the defect in the diaphragm. Another thing, do we see a, what we call a dependent viscera sign where the stomach or bowel closely approaches the posterior rib cage because normally retroperitoneum should be between um, viscous and lower rib cage. And one last tip, double check that you're not missing a traumatic hernia on trauma CTs where you see both intrathoracic and intra-abdominal blood, but no obvious organ injury. Disorders of diaphragm elevation are usually due to paralysis or eventration. Paralysis will usually involve an entire hemidiaphragm on one side and can be either temporary or permanent. The typical diagnostic imaging finding is paradoxical motion of the paralyzed hemidiaphragm during forced inspiration or a sniff maneuver. On this fluoro study, look at how the paralyzed right hemidiaphragm is not only elevated, but moves upwards while the normal left hemidiaphragm snaps downwards as the patient makes repeated sniffs or forced inspirations.
there's a long list of different reasons for why a diaphragm or hemidiaphragm may become paralyzed, but the most common one is generally phrenic nerve injury during surgery. With diaphragmatic eventrations, um, a focal region of diaphragm bulges up. The diaphragm is physically intact in these patients and there's no like macroscopic disruption or hole within the diaphragm. It's just that the diaphragm in that area has become thinned or, or weakened. Eventrations, um, with, with eventrations, there's usually a point of focal transition of the diaphragm contour at the edges of that eventration, like where this pink arrow is pointing. And the anteromedial right hemidiaphragm tends to be the most common site. Hopefully, with this talk, you'll have a more organized way of approaching chest wall and diaphragmatic um, issues on chest imaging.